Hi everybody, this is Fred Rulin with LAMA, the Library Leadership and Management Association. I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar. Uh, we have over a thousand people registered today, so we're, we're very excited to be reaching so many of you. Uh, I have a couple things I want to tell you about, about LAMA. First of all, LAMA's mission, for those of you who are not familiar with us, is to encourage and nurture current and future library leaders and to develop and promote outstanding leadership and management practices. Now the way that LAMA does this, for the most part, I'm trying to forward the slide here, ah, is through our seven sections. And our sections are really special interest groups within LAMA uh, of uh, librarians and other library professionals. And the sections are buildings and equipment, human resources, public relations and marketing, fundraising and development, measurement and evaluation, organization and management, and systems and services. So LAMA covers quite a variety of topics and special interests. And I'm going backwards here. Excuse me. For more information about LAMA and also our upcoming webinars, uh, just go to our website, www.ala.org slash LAMA with two L's, like the animal. Uh, and please feel free to contact me by email, fruland at ala.org. Uh, just a couple uh, housekeeping or technical issues today. Um, first of all, if you have any problems during the webinar, if you get kicked off of the webinar or having sound problems or a delay or something, call uh, for technical assistance 1-800-263-6317. That's the uh, Go Citrix GoToWebinar helpline. They should be able to help you. After the webinar, you will all get an email from me with a link to the recorded version. And feel free to share this with as many people as you like. Uh, and uh, you'll also get the slides and a short evaluation survey. And of course, we would greatly appreciate it if you fill out the evaluation survey. It's results from that evaluation that really allow us to produce webinars like this and uh, continue to offer both paid and, and free webinars. Today's topic is, as you must know, job hunting for today's libraries in today's job market. Our speaker today is Brian Keith, and Brian is the most, oh, I'm sorry, his title, I'll give you that, Assistant Dean of Financial and Human Resources for the George A. Smathers Library at the University of Florida. Brian is the most senior human resources and financial professional for the Smathers Libraries. This system includes 405 employees and annual funding in excess of $34 million. Brian's responsibilities include management of the recruitment process for all library positions, and in this capacity, he has led dozens of national searches for professional level positions. Additionally, he has a long and distinguished history of service to the profession, including serving as chair of LAMA's HRS Human Resources section and he has noteworthy accomplishments in research and scholarship. Brian is also a recipient of the Searcy Dynex ALA APA Award for Outstanding Achievement in Promoting Salaries and Status for Library Workers. Please help me welcome Brian Keith. Now I'm going to, uh, we have a little pause here as I turn the uh, uh, presenter, or turn the screen over to Brian, so bear with me here. We are not a completely seamless system. All right. Let's see. Why didn't it work? Okay. okay. So uh, am I uh, Am I live now? Well, um, if, let's see. Why don't you go ahead, Brian, and I will. You should be live now. Let's see. Okay. Hold on one Hold second. On. All right. Okay. Are you getting a little thing that says you're the presenter? I did. I uh, I thought I had accepted it. Um, yeah, you are. We've got your screen here, so please go ahead. Okay. Well, I uh, I, I I could not be more pleased uh, to speak to uh, to to the folks out there. Uh, I uh, I can't really add anything to uh, Fred's introduction. Uh, regarding myself, except for uh, one of the real highlights uh, for me is the opportunity to um, give uh, presentations and provide uh, useful information uh, to 
to folks uh, either it currently in the field or uh, pursuing positions in the field of librarianship. Uh, as Fred said, I'm the Assistant Dean uh, for HR and uh, Financial Services at the University of Florida. Uh, I, as I thought I would reiterate and actually provide a link uh, to uh, where today's slides are going to be posted. They currently are available there. Uh, this is a permanent link and uh, therefore the, the slides will be available. Uh, the reason I wanted to do this uh, up front is um, to to allow people not to feel like they had to jot down a lot of information um, and so that you could actually uh, just kind of uh, follow along in the, in the presentation. Um, so these slides are available and uh, all of the links, and there are a lot of links in this presentation, all of those links are functional in the slides. Uh, just to reiterate, uh, Fred's going to send you a link uh, to provide feedback on the webinar. Uh, one of the things that um, might be unique to the feedback that we're going to request is uh, your suggestions for things that might be included in a webinar like this for job seekers and also for you to provide your advice uh, to other people who are seeking jobs. Uh, and uh, we've asked for that when uh, I've given this presentation before, and, and some of that advice it has found its way into the presentation you guys are going to see today. So I really ask that you, uh, that you do uh, complete the feedback questionnaire. I, I would not be doing my job as an assistant dean of the University of Florida if I did not provide a link uh, to where uh, the UF libraries uh, post our faculty and staff positions. Uh, if you were to uh, follow this link, you would uh, see the positions we're currently advertising for and also information about Gainesville, the University of Florida Libraries, and human resources in the libraries. What we're going to cover today is uh, I'm, I'm going to start off by giving you some overall advice, just kind of some overarching opinions and uh, observances that I have. Uh, to uh, improve your odds in uh, what is a tough market, particularly a tough market for people that are uh, new to the field and seeking professional positions, and some kind of background orientation information that I think would be of use to you. Uh, I am going to cover uh, where uh, positions are typically posted uh, for library positions, uh, talk about search committees and hiring authorities, the job posting itself, uh, your application uh, materials, uh, how you might prepare for the interview, what you might expect in the interview, what to do after the interview. Uh, I have a whole section on references that talks about developing and coaching your references, and then just a few closing thoughts on improving your odds. I wanted to start off with a couple of disclaimers. Uh, the first is that, it, as you saw from the previous slide, there is a lot of material, a lot of ground I'm going to cover today. And I would, I would like to spend more time on each of those topics. Uh, uh, the, uh, I could spend an hour alone on, on resumes. I think I could probably spend more time than that. Uh, but to make up for uh, kind of a, a shortage of time, I've included links throughout the presentation to material that I think is relevant to those sections. And there really are too many participants to make this webinar as participative as, uh, as I would like. Um, we, Fred and I have discussed how we might uh, include the ability for people to ask questions, and th it doesn't seem feasible. My examples are going to uh, draw largely uh, from my experience at the University of Florida, but I believe that uh, the examples that I use and the insights I offer uh, translate to other types of libraries. The recruitment process may be a little different at UF from other academic libraries. It may be different uh, in academic libraries from public libraries. But my uh, interactions with uh, personnel officers and uh, recruitment professionals from all sorts of libraries uh, tells me that, uh, that these examples, that you can draw conclusions regardless of the type of library um, you're aspiring to um, join. And my fourth uh, is there really are no tricks. Uh, I'm providing you information, and, and, and through the use of that information and, and technique, uh, I believe you will improve your odds. That's the purpose of me providing this information. But regrettably, there's no formula that I can offer you. Uh, the first bit of overall advice that I would offer is to, to just give you some insight. 
this market, uh, there's less recruiting going on, uh, but the recruiting that going that is taking place is more deliberate in a number of ways. First of all, obviously, in selecting the candidate, um, the, the uh, also is uh, it, it, given the size of the pools. Uh, this is a recruiter's market. Uh, given the size of the pools that we're seeing, we are seeing minimally qualified, well qualified, very well qualified, ideally qualified, and over qualified candidates. And we're, as recruiters, we're being deliberate uh, about uh, selecting from these different stratas. And we also, uh, for which positions are actually making it to uh, be posted, uh, we're not filling every position that becomes vacant and have not for some time. So the positions that uh, you will see are, have competed against other positions. Um, I wanted to provide, to kind of give insight into uh, the types of positions that are being advertised uh, by academic libraries. I thought that I would provide a link to a, a national study that UF is participating in, uh, and it's, uh, it, it covers the um, uh, recruitment activities and the efficacy of those. But it provides uh, a list of working titles and specialists um, for professional library searches that um, that have, have taken place in the in the immediate past, and the uh, this is uh, the actual page, um, and it provides information on this project. But there's a, a available to the public is a, a reporting tool, and if you go there, um, there are 52 searches that are included uh, currently. And the working titles that are represented, um, I think, are um, uh, would be informative as to the types of positions that you see advertised. Generally, what um, are being uh, recruited for are uh, more technical positions, uh, less entry uh, position. If they do not require experience, they require some sort of technical um, uh, specifications, specialized skills. Um, so, like I said, I, 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 this is a, a study that's available. The data that's in there is um, available on the uh, internet. So, I thought I would provide a link to that, so you could look at the types of positions that are are being searched for. But my guess is that it's uh, it, it would confirm some anecdotal um, experience uh, or perceptions that you have from looking at the positions that you see advertised. Back to the overall advice. I would encourage you to determine your salary requirements and apply to positions accordingly. Uh, do you have trailing partners considerations? Um, I would, in where you have someone's income that you need to take into account for the household, and I would refer to the ARL salary survey and, and to the ALA APA salary survey, and that will allow you to kind of orient uh, your search. Um, based upon the posted salaries. Uh, and what I would encourage you is based upon that uh, to, uh, to apply to fewer positions but to do a better job of those fewer applications. Uh, it, at this point, um, it, through mail merge, it's extremely easy to apply uh, to 100 positions in a day. Uh, I have not talked to a recruiting uh, professional or a placement officer who has not been of the opinion that um, doing fewer but better applications actually would improve your odds. I would encourage you to develop your message. If you haven't thought about it, think about um, what you want to re represent to hiring authorities. Um, this would include how your qualifications match the jobs. Preferably, uh, you would state it, uh, how they uniquely match this job and why this job makes sense for you. That's your message. Uh, you deliver your message through the application materials, through the interview, uh, telephone or face-to-face, -face, and through the selection of your references, uh, folks, that, folks that can speak to um, the specific qualifications necessary for this position. Do not rely on search committees to figure out your message on their own, how you qualify for the position. They will earnestly try. Uh, but whatever you can do to make it easier for them to connect your qualifications to what they're looking for, the better your odds are. And just one more piece of uh, overall advice uh, to add, be able to answer if you are asked um, 
by a recruiter or by the search committee or the hiring authority. Be able to explain uh, why you want this job. I'm, I'm often uh, surprised that um, folks are unable to answer that question, and it's, it's really helpful if you can state that. Another piece of overall advice, I would encourage you to take advantage of uh, the unique opportunity afforded by your cover letter. Um, I, uh, I, it really, um, I, I, I'm going to spend a lot of time on cover, letter, cover, cover letters in this presentation, but uh, they really um, are, are the opportunity for you to create a narrative, to explain gaps, to explain how your qualifications apply. And I would encourage you to come up with a couple of template uh, cover letters that you modify for each search. Uh, seek out opportunities that engage, but that ref reflect engagement, enthusiasm, and leadership in the field of librarianship or relate to the field of librarianship. And if you haven't been doing that, I would encourage you to do that now. Um, and I'll talk about um, my thoughts on, on some uh, traditional and non-traditional ways uh, to, to uh, to achieve that. Consider your employment alternatives. Uh, as I mentioned before, as you guys probably are aware, this is a tough market, uh, but uh, an MLS degree or the equivalent um, is a very generally applicable uh, degree. Um, this may not be your, uh, your ideal, but um, uh, it, based upon the reality of the market, you might consider other uh, uses for that degree. And I've included here a couple of uh, links to references on, on different types of careers for MLS degrees. Um, I would also, just as kind of a general reference, um, Alex uh, had an e-forum, uh, which was called Job Hunting a Conversation about how to do it well uh, a couple of months ago. It was led by um, a colleague of mine, uh, uh, Tiffany uh, Eatman Allen and Erica Finley. And I, uh, the, I've provided a link to the archive. This was a back and forth discussion of re between recruiters. It was a moderated discussion between recruiters and job seekers. And um, I think it's a terrific resource. So I'm providing that link for you. And then uh, a couple of additional links to websites um, that just kind of provide general overall career and job hunting advice that complements what's in my presentation. Uh, and I um, am uh, providing a, a link to the career development uh, resources provided by ALA. Uh, on the next slide, I um, provide a link to the Career Placement Center. Um, they, I can't speak highly enough of the, um, of the, the folks at the ALA uh, career office. And uh, San Jose State University's uh, library school has a, a terrific uh, career development website um, that is publicly accessible, and so there's a link for that. Uh, and uh, very recently, uh, there's an ALA publication uh, that uh, came out, uh, which is a librarian's perspective uh, that I, th I think is a, a real quality work. I've provided a link to that, and um, to uh, again to the ALA Placement Center. That the, the types of services they provide at midwinter and annual conference for ALA. If you do uh, go to those conferences are excellent and this link uh, provides information about uh, uh, what, what they've provided at past um, uh, conferences. And last uh, but not least in the references, uh, I have included a, what I think is a really interesting uh, study that was funded by an ALA grant about the uh, hiring of non-MLS librarians into professional positions. Um, the, um, I can tell you that the MLS is still critically important, but besides that, um, there's a lot of inf interesting information on the perspectives of directors and um, uh, on uh, the, the value of, uh, and the, uh, the importance of an MLS degree in their recruiting from both public and, and academic uh, libraries. Uh, where are positions posted? Uh, I think they fall into some uh, broad categories, uh, regional uh, uh, and consortial uh, sites, uh, professional association, uh, and then employer-specific sites like the University of Florida Libraries or the University of Florida webpage. Um, and then uh, a lot of uh, posting activity takes place through the electronic mailing lists of different associations or different um, specializations. Um, some of the most common uh, are the uh, ALA job list, 
the Chronicle of Higher Education for uh, Academic Libraries, um, LibGigs, uh, LISjobs.com. Um, there is there are a couple of sites that provide lists of uh, of, of the locations where uh, library jobs are posted. I've included those links. I I hope uh, that those are helpful to you in, in orienting where to look for positions. And then uh, again, the uh, Academic Libraries Recruitment Study that I, I showed you earlier, um, it includes a, a lot of information on where uh, libraries are posting positions. Um, there are some uh, really nice uh, kind of uh, uh, tools that you can use to manage uh, your search. Uh, there are there are aggregators um, and uh, that will uh, uh, help you uh, collect uh, uh, information and RSS feeds. Um, I'm sure there are others, but here are uh, two that I'm aware of, uh, and they allow you to uh, to become aware of, of vacancies as they're posted. Uh, what you need to know about search committees. The first thing is uh, that selection is the process of weeding out. Uh, every search when we start it, the overriding concern of the committee is will we have enough applicants? And then as soon as we begin to receive dozens of applications, uh, they uh, kind of focus on the job of sorting them out and weeding them out and getting it down to a manageable list. And we are uh, getting bumper crops of applications. Uh, the assessment of qualifications in order to weed out um, falls into two categories, what's measurable and what they have to use their judgment and inference for. Uh, measurement would be if there are years of experience that are, are a requirement for the position, uh, they would be able to uh, hopefully clearly see that in your resume. Uh, there are other things that they have to uh, kind of infer. Is this a good colleague? They want someone who's collegial. Is this person inventive or flexible? Um, and so I think as you keep in mind um, your application materials, um, I would not spend as much time in my cover letter talking about my years of experience as I would in trying to communicate uh, the, these other kind of things that they're going to have to infer. There's a limited means available to the search committee uh, to learn uh, these different things that they're looking for. Uh, first of all are the documents. They are clearly critical. Uh, the other are the references that you choose, and um, I would be extremely deliberate in uh, selecting the references, and, you, and I assume that you would have different references for different positions depending upon uh, how, depending on how narrow your, um, your search is. Uh, they have the interview sessions clearly, and they have the presentation that people provide. Um, I have a little note in here that says do not underestimate estimate the importance of this. It's the part of, if, if there is a presentation required as part of the on-site application, it's uh, likely to be the most heavily attended session. Uh, and I spend some more time later in the presentation uh, with some more specific recommendations for presentations. They also can judge by your interactions with staff. Um, both verbal and nonverbal. So, you know, when you think about uh, what's covered in your CV or, or your resume or your cover letter, I would think about how these, how these other elements, what part of your message about your qualifications you want to get across. Because if you think about it, it really is difficult for a search committee to do their job and, and to um, arrive at the information they need to select. Uh, search committees, uh, my experience has been they are conscientious, uh, they're quite likely to be intelligent, um, they are likely to have a stake in the position and therefore the outcome of the search, but they are most likely not very skilled or experienced recruiters. Um, and so, again, I would not count on them to uh, derive from uh, a long resume uh, some piece that you could state in a sentence in a cover letter. Uh, this goes back to the putting them in a position to be successful. Uh, the job posting uh, is uh, obviously uh, critically important and I encourage you to, uh, to read it and to assume that every part in it uh, was, uh, was put in there with intention. Uh, in reading it, uh, I would first assess, is this interesting to me? Are these the sort of responsibilities that I would have? But then I would spend um, probably the, the, my decision 
as much as that about whether to apply would be based upon how my qualifications match the requirements of the position versus the preferred qualifications. So there is a distinction and uh, required qualifications uh, in most employers will mean the person has to have that in order to be considered for the position and they have to have those required qualifications as stated. The preferred qualifications allow uh, the employer to distinguish between uh, the, the, the folks that are qualified. And uh, this goes back to the previous slide where I talked about ideally qualified, well qualified, and the preferred qualifications allow that. If you are missing a, a clearly stated required qualification, I would encourage you to focus on another position. Uh, as a public employer, as a large employer, as a conscientious employer, uh, it would not be permitted at UF for us to, if we had a pool of minimally qualified or qualified individuals, to pick someone who did not have the, the uh, a required qualification. The one exception to that, and I assume this applies at other employers, is the degree. If we require a MLS degree or equivalent and the person is in pursuit of that, um, it's possible for us to do a provisional placement and we give the person a deadline by which to uh, complete their master's degree. So we have had instances where we offered a, a professional librarian position where it required a master's degree to someone who was in their last semester or in the course of their second to the last semester, and we just state. But besides that, I would really use the required qualifications as a tool to narrow uh, to the positions that you should spend the most time uh, applying for. Clearly, the um, salary and location um, are important um, in allowing you to uh, determine uh, where, um, where you should focus your most attention and the deadline. Uh, just like the required qualifications, the deadline, if, if, it's, if it's past the deadline, uh, we would not be able to accept uh, an application. Most um, employers will not. If it's a job that's really um, very interesting to you. I think it's legitimate to contact the employer and maybe inquire as to whether the search has been extended or if it will be extended. But um, I would assume deadlines are, are really um, are hard. Uh, look at the job posting for what they're requiring uh, as far as uh, submissions and make sure you do. I would not count on the um, committee or the HR office to follow up with you if, if some document is missing or in the wrong format. Um, and one other thing, I, if, if they do require an essay or an opinion piece or a writing sample on a topic, uh, if you do use, uh, if you do re reference other people's works, um, I would encourage you to cite and give credit for those. Um, I, um, I can tell you that librarians are skilled at, um, at kind of figuring uh, that sort of uh, uh, plagiarism. Maybe that's too strong of a word, uh, but I, I would encourage you to, to, um, to reference where you see that. We see that on occasion, and, and I, I know other employers do. Um, I thought I would uh, show you a sample uh, position vacancy announcement. That's uh, kind of a long term for a job ad at UF. And, um, this is a uh, Word document uh, that for, that's the position vacancy announcement for a psychology and sociology subject specialist that uh, we uh, advertised a couple of years ago. And uh, a couple of the things I would look at are the rank. Um, it's an assistant university librarian. Uh, that's a pretty typical career rank system. What this would tell me, um, particularly if I went to the UF website and looked around, is that this is the first of three librarian ranks. This is an entry-level position um, and kind of frame based upon that. Um, we've posted a minimum uh, salary of uh, 42000 uh, Based upon the person's credentials, it's possible that we can go higher. Um, I would tell you that the biggest, um, the biggest limitation on the ability to, um, to exceed um, posted minimums is always going to be internal equity, what the salaries of the people who are already here uh, are making or at, the, at whatever institution, and the uh, desire to avoid compression. And so in this, we've stated that uh, we may be able to, uh, to 
to put more money on the table if a person has some uh, uh, preferred qualifications, for example. Uh, but I would, if your salary expectations are 60,000 or your needs are 60, I would, I would kind of take into account that this is posted at 42, and focus on a different position because that would be about 40 percent higher than this posted, and it's very unlikely we would get there. Um, you see the deadline. We've included a note that tells people uh, to please be sure to um, to submit all of the documents. We may not follow up with people. We may not have the time to follow up with people. Some search committees and hiring authorities consider it uh, to be a um, kind of a an indication that someone's not detail oriented if they do not include all of the uh, application materials. So we include that in bold. There's a job summary that talks about the position. The responsibilities are stated. Um, we like a nice long position vacancy announcement at the University of Florida. We put a lot of details in it. And we um, include um, a, a lot of information about the qualifications that we're looking for. Again, we have required qualifications. Every person that we would um, be able to offer the position to would have these. And then we have the preferred qualifications, which would distinguish um, a candidate from the other qualified candidates. Um, the thing that I would kind of point out to you is the wealth of information that is made available um, to uh, potential applicants for this position. And if someone is really interested in this position and they don't use this to maybe highlight some things in their cover letter, I think that they've missed an opportunity. And that's one of the elements of applying better that I mentioned in, in my first couple of slides. Uh, there's some information about the University of Florida. There's some information about Gainesville, some information about the benefits. And then there's um, information uh, regarding uh, the specifics of how to apply. And um, it indicates that we prefer an MS Word or PDF format. Um, that uh, we would like a cover letter, and we kind of give people a hint that we're at, that we would like, other than please find attached my resume and references, that we would actually like people to explain to us why they're interested and how they feel they're qualified for the position, um, and then a um, written statement uh, on a topical um, on, on a topic that's relevant to this position. And in this instance, it's a written statement regarding how technological advances and web-based application used in information sharing are changing collections and service in psychology and sociology. 250 words, is uh, the thought is that that should be, uh, for someone that's going to be a player for this position, it should be uh, pretty uh, easy for them to, to generate that. Uh, we ask for a current resume and a list of three references. And then there's information. Um, so again, um, I guess what I would draw from the position vacancy announcement is the real wealth of information that you can use to refine the um, materials that you submit in your cover letter. But I understand that you're going to submit dozens of cover letters, if not more, and you're not necessarily going to want to really modify every um, cover letter. But if you make it to the phone interview, I would go through these and highlight and, and consider how my experience matches these specific qualifications and not rely on the search committee and com help them uh, connect those dots. And maybe some of it's not obvious, and maybe some of it you're using experience in a different industry. Um, so I, I really would encourage you to, um, to, to take advantage of the amount of information uh, the cards that are shown to you by the employer. I would also um, suggest, if it's not obvious, that um, if you go to a place like the Chronicle of Higher Education where we post our jobs, you will she see the short ad. And that's a, a, you know, a representative uh, a piece of the position vacancy announcement. But they charge by the word, so by definition it's not going to be the full four-page position vacancy vacancy announcement. So if you see a position, you may want to go to the institution's website, even if they do not provide a link in the short ad, and see if a full ad is posted. Again, just because information is power, um, it would give you more information to uh, know how to present yourself most effectively. Uh, consider your application. It, it, it really is your representative to the screening committee, and in some instances it may be the only thing they see. Um, so I would encourage you to really call through it. Um, Tailor these documents to the information and the posting 
uh, to the extent that's feasible. Uh, again, maybe come up with multiple templates. And I would explicitly state how you're qualified for this job. Uh, that will improve your odds, and that's what you need to do in this market. Um, how is your submission used um, by the search committee? Um, at the University of Florida and at other institutions, we use a criteria chart. That's the term that we use for it. And it's a way of us organizing the information that comes in from the potentially dozens of applicants we may have for a position. And I'll show you a um, anonymized example of the criteria chart that was used for the psychology and sociology uh, librarian position that we just looked at the PVA. And so if you look at this, uh, you will see uh, where the candidates' names were. I've anonymized it um, by putting Greek letters, and this continues on. Um, there were a lot of applicants for this position. And you will see the minimum qualifications and preferred qualifications for the position. And then you will see where the search committee has input comments based upon the materials they've received. They update it after the phone interviews. And they are trying to organize in a way um, how, to, um, how to assess and prioritize the folks that they are going to uh, focus their recruitment, their limited recruitment efforts on. And the ones that are always kind of disappointing to me are these can't tells. Uh, sometimes they use maybes. And um, so, you know, my thought by showing this to you, you may not be in, interested in, in a psychology or sociology position. This one's closed anyway. But to tell you that search committees are conscientious and they and hiring authorities, and they are, even if they're doing this in a, in a less formal way, the easier you can make it for them to understand how your qualifications match these, the better. And uh, so that's, I, I, this is kind of showing you some of our trade secrets um, and uh, some insight that, I, that I, I think maybe not everyone has. Uh, one of the other ways is that it, it, in, in most uh, of our searches you'll see excellent written and verbal communications. Um, I would encourage you to pay serious attention, obviously, to grammar and punctuation and, de and decorum in, in the documents and the communications that you make. These are short documents, but they're very time consuming if they're done well. And I would also uh, I, I think it'll improve your odds if you can uh, kind of infuse some enthusiasm into the materials. Uh, the cover letter. Please, uh, if you, everyone assumes that people are using template cover letters, but it's helpful if you uh, will make sure that the, um, that the address line and those things are correct. Um, it's, that's kind of a frequent, free, frequent gaffe that we see. Um, not necessarily a disqualifier, but not helpful. Uh, refer to the correct position, including the requisition number in the subject line, uh, because it, it may be going to a central uh, recruiting office or the university or the, the library system may recruit at an institutional level, and so that will help in the routing. Use the opportunity of the cover letter. This is a unique um, uh, part of your submission. Um, it's really the only place you can use the word I as the subject of a sentence unless you make it to the phone interview and the cover letter's purpose is to get you to the phone interview or the face-to-face -face interview. This is a narrative that you can use to tell your story and it serves as a mortar to explain the different parts of your packet that you're submitting, um, how you, why you've chosen these references. Um, and my general rule of thumb, uh, though, we see them longer, we see them shorter, is that the most effective cover letter is going to be uh, one and a half pages or so. Um, much longer than that, it's going to be, uh, it may not be read completely, um, uh, or it, it may be seen as, you know, someone's uh, inability to kind of rein themselves in. Uh, Explain in your cover letter why you are of interest, why the position is a good move for you, and connect your qualifications, which means why this is a good bet for them. Uh, again, this is your message started in the cover letter. Explain your career or personal path, particularly if it's interesting um, or atypical. Um, and uh, it, you know, it's a, for, 
for folks that are just starting off in the career, there may be less of a career path, but maybe explain what brought you um, to, to the field that you're interested in entering. If you have significant changes in the types of jobs or institution types, um, I would explain. Um, if you have breaks in employment, I would briefly explain those in the cover letter. Uh, if you have frequent or numerous job changes, um, I might you know, explain those in summary. Those are things that the search committee is going to be trying to figure out. And if you, know, if you can address them, um, it, I think it will improve your odds. Um, if you're moving from uh, an academic institution to a public institution or vice versa, and I might explain, um, you know, your interest uh, in that. Uh, I would try and communicate how your experiences have made you more suitable for the position in question, uh, how you've stayed current, uh, particularly if, if you've been um, unemployed for some period of time, how you've used that time to credential yourself. Um, the relevant experiences that you might share could clearly be from a different industry. I think the search committees uh, and the hiring authorities are, are really, particularly if you help them in the cover letter, are really willing to draw those connections. They might be at a different professional level. Um, we will very often see people that have uh, worked in libraries in a volunteer capacity or in a staff uh, capacity and they're applying for a faculty position at UF. Um, and, and, and those are great. Those are, are really useful credentials. Um, and um, what people have done while they're in school, particularly if, that, if, if they're new um, and maybe the project work they've done in school may be the strongest foot they could put forward, credit is given for that. And uh, also um, through your service to the profession, if you volunteered, in a student chapter or in, in some other um, uh, profession, relevant professional or organization. Uh, th there's some links I'm providing here uh, to cover letters. I, I, I could spend the entire time we have today talking on cover letters. Um, I'm a, a real believer and uh, these are some um, links that I think are uh, useful. Uh, next I want to talk to you in, as far as your applicant submission. The difference between a CV and a resume, um, this may be obvious to some folks, it, it, but it, uh, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time, though we could spend a, a very long time on the topics of CVs and resumes. Generally, you will see CVs requested for academic or, or professional um, medical uh, positions, uh, and the resume is the more typical for businesses. If you are in school now and, or, in, or not and, and you're interested in a, a, moving towards an academic um, uh, institution. I would encourage you to go ahead and work on a CV while you do not have a deadline in mind and uh, begin uh, cultivating a CV. Uh, you will see it commonly asked for, um, becoming less commonly asked for. At UF, we ask for a resume. We will often receive uh, CVs. Uh, from folks who are coming from other academic environments. Uh, what is a CV? It is a, uh, a complete list of employment, education, trainings, presentations. The webinar I'm giving today will appear on my CV. All of the publications, professional memberships, grants, whether uh, applied for and awarded or applied for and unsuccessful, fellowships, uh, professional awards and honors folks have received, and a resume, I think, most people are probably more familiar with those. They will talk about education and employment and awards and accomplishments, but it's going to be uh, much briefer and, and typically in uh, bullets or sentences. A CV can really be unlimited. Uh, I believe my CV is 16 pages. Uh, my resume is two pages. Uh, when I became a, a HR professional, there were some of us who were trying to stick to one pages. That's pretty much gone, uh, but I would I would encourage you to stick to a couple of pages. Um, the CV is a list of lists. The resume is a list of accomplishments, including facts and figures and measurements and uh, amounts of budgets managed, those sorts of things. One of the things that I would encourage you in a CV if you produce it, and as a, in a resume if you can do it uh, in a way um, that is uh, effective, I would encourage you to um, uh, maybe include hyperlinks uh, because most places are going to receive these electronically and particularly in a CV 
um, if you have your presentation or your poster posted somewhere, um, it's really a, a useful way of, of kind of getting up, making it more available to the hiring authority. Again, I could spend uh, a, a very long time on CVs and resumes and time doesn't permit today, uh, but here are some links uh, from some sites that I think are, are uh, provide good uh, information that are publicly accessible and I encourage you to um, take a look at those if you're interested. Uh, some thoughts on communication. Uh, emails, uh, in case this is not obvious, um, and if we're seeing less of this, uh, it seems like people have been become more sophisticated in this area. You may have a hilarious email uh, address that you use for your own personal uh, correspondence. I would encourage you maybe to get a, you know, a, a more standardized Gmail address. It, it, again, this isn't going to be disqualifying, but uh, that's a bit of advice. And I would also treat emails as professional correspondence. Uh, people will disclose or uh, behave in emails in ways that they would never in a print letter. I would encourage you to rise to the level of treating this as um, the same way you would on a, a printed letter on letterhead. Uh, is your voicemail message suitable for potential employers? Um, folks may, you may be known as the person with the hilarious uh, voicemail messages, and, uh, but your uh, friends will understand uh, if, if you have to come up with kind of a boring one while you're job hunting. In telephone interviews, um, I, I really think this is a medium that where the field is entirely slanted to the advantage of the applicant. Uh, by taking advantage of the medium, what I would mean is if you were applying for that psychology, sociology position that I showed you before, if you did not have the PVA um, open on your desk with notes in the margins next to those required qualifications, if you did not have your um, resume or CV in front of you uh, for you to reference, you know, quickly. If you didn't have those things, I really think you would you would be um, giving up a, a real advantage. The other thing is have a beverage, um, kind of commonsensical, um, and uh, do not multitask. Um, I've heard more than one search committee comment on the fact that they could hear the person typing while they were trying to conduct a phone interview. Again, maybe none of these things are disqualifiers, but they're just not helpful. Uh, an online presence and branding, um, uh, most all of us have those, whether we think of them that way. Use them in a way that distinguishes yourself. First of all, your social networking. If, it, if it's social networking, I would control the access. Um, you can uh, sign up for Google Alerts uh, based upon your own identity and as information, uh, it's, it's Google finds information or information's posted, um, you'll receive alerts. Uh, SlideShare and Scribd are both ways to share um, your uh, productivity and to kind of begin to establish a presence for yourself um, where you can share documents and slides and, and um, get your name out there, have something for people to, if they Google, where it comes up for something that's scholarly or represent your engagement. And then participating in listservs, joining listservs, and also you know, commenting, um, having your name um, out there. Whether you're new to the field or you're establishing a reputation for that next position, um, I would encourage you to do that. Uh, there's some links that I've provided here uh, on the, the concept of online presence and branding that I hope might be of use to you. In preparation for the interview, uh, the, the tried and true practice, role play with somebody, many people um, are um, uh, uncomfortable talking um, candidly about their strengths. Uh, this is a unique type of conversation, interviewing, and so I would encourage you to get over that and also get good at it. Um, and um, practice discussing and addressing weaknesses. Um, if they come up, you want to be able to um, speak to them directly. There are innumerable lists of common interview questions and you, you're likely to hear them. Uh, I encourage you to, to, to kind of prep on those, think about what your answers would be. 
uh, assess uh, where your strengths and weaknesses are, focus on the weaknesses um, and improving those. And as you go on interviews, um, you may only go on one interview, I hope that's the case, but if you go on multiple interviews, kind of assess, wow, I wish I had answered that question differently or I wish I wouldn't have asked that question. Self-assess and learn throughout. There are six things interviewers are going to want to know, and you want to help them understand these. Do you have the necessary skills? We tell you what those are in our position vacancy announcements. Do you have things that we can't train and that we need you to come in the door with? We can help you with skills or familiarize you with our environment, um, but we need you to have atti good attitude, aptitude, and you need to be motivated. And if you can communicate those, um, through the activities you're engaged in, through the things that you point out in your cover letter. Uh, will you fit in? Uh, do you understand the job? Um, are, you know, it's always, that's always helpful. Um, how do you compare to other applicants, uh, clearly? Um, and uh, do you want the job and will you stay? Um, if you can address these things that interviewers are all looking for. For recent MLS uh, graduates in particular, I would, um, in preparing for the interview, consider how I'm going to present my maturity and my flexibility and adaptability. Um, I think these are, in my opinion, these are um, they're important for everyone, uh, but they're particularly important um, for people who are new to the field. Uh, if you can learn about the organization, uh, these are all sorts of things that, if a person is more knowledgeable about these, they're going to perform more effectively in the interview. Uh, the peer organizations, the University of Florida is an academic research library, the University of Florida is an AAU. Um, these are things, th these are ways that we consider ourselves in the, in the, in the industry and, and would be helpful things for people to be able to understand and maybe reference. Again, not necessarily in the cover letter, but if you're coming in for an interview. Uh, specific to the position, we give a lot of information about what the position does, how it fits into the organization. If it has some unique status like a faculty status or tenure accruing, um, if you're not familiar with those terms and they're relevant to that position, I would do some researching um, I, I, and be able to understand how you're being engaged uh, in ways that are relevant to the stat those statuses that the position may have. And for a librarian position at the University of Florida, uh, we and for some other uh, professional positions, we have three criteria by which we assess people's performance. The first is their job performance, and the second is scholarship and service to the field. And so I would, if I were coming to interview, I would be interested in what expectations there may be besides uh, uh, just the normal uh, duties of the position and what percentage of effort those are expected, the weights that those have. Um, this is particularly um, relevant to academic uh, positions, but I think it's, you know, in special libraries and other libraries, uh, the, the, something similar to this would be relevant and I would consider it and, uh, you know, be in a position to ask questions about it. Um, I would prepare questions to ask, um, and as you encounter folks for whom they would be relevant, I would ask them, why is this position available? Is this a new position? Uh, expectations for the position from various stakeholders and the opportunities uh, for advancement. If you can get the expectations for the position communicated to you uh, and then can respond in ways in which it makes it easy for them to understand how you would deliver on those expectations, that really is a, a key thing for you to achieve. Uh, as far as additional questions, what are they looking for as, as far as candidates, attributes? Um, again, if you can get uh, an a interviewer to provide that and then uh, follow up with it. Um, with how your qualifications connect to those. I think it's that, that, again, improves your odds, and that's what I'm trying to help you do. Uh, the, um, some questions that you might have, I would have a, a series of questions just because uh, the, the interviewers may be introverted people. They may not be skilled interviewers, and if you can get the conversation started, um, it's going to be a... Um, 
it's going to be a better experience for both and, and, and more pleasant and, and hopefully more effective um, and give you things to, um, to, to engage them with. Um, if there's a relevant hot topic uh, in the field, you might bring that up. It, again, it communicates relevance and um, uh, in, in almost every session you can expect to have the opportunity to ask questions and the general theme I would take from these slides is uh, if you have some questions prepared, it's, it, it's useful. I would encourage you not to ask about salary and benefits first. Um, you, um, you, someone may bring that up with you uh, the day of the interview. It may not come up the day of the interview. It may come up later, um, but it's just uh, generally uh, I, I encourage you to leave that be. And then I would balance your enthusiasm for professional development activities. Uh, if you are coming to a place like the University of Florida where uh, scholarship is a requirement of the position. There's a balance, particularly if you're coming from an academic background or a specialist background and are just completing your MLS or you're, you're entering libraries. The person that's hiring you is likely thinking about uh, reference desk shifts or um, instruction load. and they also want to know that you're able to um, to handle the other criteria, the other elements of the job, but you want them to understand a balance and that you understand a balance. I think this is particularly true uh, for folks that are coming from uh, from academic positions or other specialist positions and are new to libraries uh, for them to understand that it really is a service center. So that's what I mean here. Um, if people do not tell you before the interview, um, again, these may not be skilled. Uh, uh, these may not be skilled interviewers or very experienced interviewers, or they may have gotten rusty because they haven't done very many interviews recently because of the uh, fiscal environment. If no one, if you're flying in and no one tells you uh, how you're going to get around, I would ask. If you are responsible for your own transportation, just to reduce stress for the day of, I would stake out where you're going to park and particularly at UF uh, it, it, because parking is so difficult and in metropolitan areas. Um, and if you have special needs, I would communicate them. Uh, it's often people will ask me, when should I communicate that I have um, special needs or requirements? And what I mean by special needs, th those could be um, physical needs. Um, they could also be religious observances. They could also be um, uh, some, some sort of uh, family needs uh, where a person uh, has a, a, a child that's still, uh, that is breastfeeding. Um, whenever those are relevant, I would communicate them. Whenever they're going to have the, um, wh wherever they might be an issue that makes it more difficult for you to present yourself in the most favorable light um, or to, to, to compete for the position, that's the relevant point. And I think that you will find um, recruiters and hiring authorities and libraries to be very respectful of these needs and very accommodating. And all of those examples I provided before, we routinely accommodate for folks. So, but particularly uh, as you're preparing for an on-site interview, I would communicate any needs you have. Uh, and, and those might include dietary um, uh, requirements. Uh, Learn who you will meet with. If an itinerary is not provided, um, you, you, I, it's completely legitimate to ask for one. Um, and if you're interacting with an HR office, if, if you recall from the position vacancy announcement I showed before, uh, that had um, contact information, it would be completely appropriate and pretty routine for people to, to make inquiries um, to us, though we do provide an itinerary. Um, make some assumptions as to why individuals or groups are on that schedule. They're all placed on there deliberately, and I would think about what you can get from them and what you want them to know about you after that session. And I have a simple sample interview itinerary uh, for the um, psychology and sociology uh, position that I've been using as our example. Um, so our uh, interviews are full days. Um, the um, uh, they begin the day with a search committee, typically. Then they would meet with the humanities and social sciences uh, faculty and staff of that branch, which is called Library West at, at UF. And uh, then there's a time for them to prepare for their presentation. Uh, we have an hour uh, set aside on, uh, for the presentation, um, and that would include time for Q&A. 
Uh, there's lunch. Sometimes we'll um, specify who's going to the lunch if we know it uh, at the time we're developing this. And then there's a meeting with the chair and the associate chair of that branch with uh, one of my colleagues um, who works in employee relations to talk about benefits and those sorts of things. Uh, there is a meeting with just the humanities and social sciences librarians and with the library deans, a representative of the TMP committee, tenure and promotion committee, and a tour of the library itself. One of the things that's um, not on this um, is a specific session, but one of the things we might see uh, for a subject specialist would be a session with uh, members of the academic department uh, on campus, the members of the psychology or sociology department. Psychology is one of the largest, sociology is one of the largest on campus. And so we'll often have uh, those sessions. And so what I would do is think about, break this into sessions and what questions I might have for folks um, that are different and, um, and where, these, where the folks that would attend these would overlap. And um, try and just think about what you can learn and what you want to communicate, as I said before. Um, if there's a presentation, uh, solicit reasonable information about it. What is the, uh, who will be in the audience? If you're going to have handouts, how large is the audience? If you're not going to have handouts but you want to um, engage the audience, how many people, it, it's much easier to engage in some exercises, 15 people than rather than 50 and vice versa. Also try and determine what their expertise level is so that you're speaking to them and you, don't, you do not seem too rudimentary or too complex. Um, what we most typically might see is, is like overly uh, rudimentary. But uh, those are legitimate things for you to either ask the search committee about or for you to ask the HR uh, department that contact and they can try and find that. Um, if you have questions about the topic um, that where you need clarification, um, those are legitimate questions. And then also the media, uh, what sort of software will be used? Um, is there just really anything that's relevant? And again, if you have if you have some needs uh, that need to be accommodated in that area, cover the topic uh, that's asked for. And you might want to repeat the topic uh, in the beginning uh, or incorporate it into early on into your presentation um, so that the people in the audience are, know specifically what you were asked to talk about. But be sure to cover that topic. Um, if you can, uh, try and incorporate relevant information about the institution that um, shows effort, it shows interest, uh, it shows all good things. Uh, clearly practice. And be prepared for technical glitches. Um, it, 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 they, we try and avoid them, but you know how you might address those, like having a printed copy of your slides, obviously. So, if worst case scenario, you just have to read and tell people uh, what they would have been seeing. At least you're able to to go forward. Um, as I mentioned before, I just I can't tell you um, how important the presentation is. My own personal feeling is that it may be. Um, overly um, weighted in the recruitment process, but it's a very important thing and I, I encourage you to uh, take it seriously. After the inter uh, uh, as far as the interview, the, 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 again, the, this is general information and, and, and there's uh, plenty of information available and I have some links I'll show you. As far as your appearance, it's always better to appear fresh and rested, alert. You can relax because your talent got you to that point, you should listen um, and respond to uh, questions and, and, and uh, draw conclusions and engage in, a, in, in an active conversation. My advice is do not smoke or smell like smoke. It's my presentation, so it's in here. Um, it's, that may be the most controversial bullet in this whole thing. Uh, I would encourage you to dress for the position and lean towards conservative. Um, Learn people's names and positions uh, whenever possible. Uh, clearly uh, communicate where your previous uh, training and experience apply to what they're looking for. And understand that your attitude and demeanor, basically your behavior um, and appearance is as important as your responses. Be polite to everyone. One of the really nice things about libraries, uh, particularly in the academic environment, is the um, that even though you, you do have different 
types of employment statuses you have uh, or conditions. You have staff positions and faculty positions. The collaboration, cooperation, and collegiality between those is critically important. So I would encourage you to be very polite to everyone if, if, if you need any encouragement in that regard. Um, there are ways uh, through your body language to communicate your interest in um, what the interviewer is saying, and uh, I would uh, try and incorporate those. Um, as far as uh, answers to questions, practice being positive about your qualifications if you need that. Um, it, you know, it's kind of an American uh, thing to be self-deprecating, and this is not the time for that. Um, describe uh, how your qualifications specifically relate. If you have weaknesses, mitigate them with strengths, uh, it's some other area that you're strong. And always, it's, it's never good to have negative or remarks regarding your previous employers. Um, be brief but thorough. Uh, if you um, have a propensity to being long-winded, try and rein it in. Um, use specific examples from your experience to illustrate points and be sincere and direct. Uh, don't talk over people. Don't be too serious. Don't look at your watch. Be honest but on guard and ask great questions. But mostly enjoy yourself. People are going to be really nice to you and very interested in you. Um, it's a unique experience to be interviewed and you can pretty much anticipate the opportunity to learn something and meet interesting people. I would encourage you in the interview to, um, if you have issues with gaps of employment, and people are very understanding of those, demotions, people are generally understanding of those, terminations, those are harder for people to understand. But if you have these issues in your employment history, I would encourage you to honestly uh, address those in the interview um, because you don't want it to come out in a reference and never be discussed with you. Um, and like I said, I, in, these categories you're going to find that um, recruiters are, are sophisticated and understanding. In all phases of the interview, uh, get across your message uh, and do not count on the interviewer to do a great job. Again, they, they may be skilled and intelligent in some other area. Uh, help them uh, get across how your qualifications fit their needs. Um, Strive to communicate these sought-after qualities. In summary, these would be uh, your uh, interpersonal skills, your intelligence and aptitude, your enthusiasm and energy, your flexibility, your potential or actual leadership, and your maturity. Uh, there's, uh, there are tons of uh, uh, links out there. These are some that I um, thought were actually good and would be of use. Um, and there's a long list of them. So after the interview, you've completed the interview, um, should you follow up with a thank you letter uh, or email, more likely, or a card? Uh, you know, I don't know if that really improves um, your odds. I, I can't think of an instance where I've seen that improve it, but definitely follow up if you need to clarify or address an issue or if you agree to provide some additional information and follow up promptly. Um, I don't know what you would need to clarify or what issue might have arisen, but th those are instances for sure uh, follow-up. Uh, in anticipation of an offer following the interview, consider do you want the job? If you know that you're not interested in the position, I think it's a good faith thing to tell people. Um, but uh, you know, I would think about it, and then based upon that, I would consider how much you need, uh, what you think the fair uh, salary is for the position, and if you have partner considerations. Um, I would, um, if you're going to, if you're applying to a larger employer, particularly a university, and uh, you think that they may have trailing spouse um, uh, programs, I would probably bring that up um, in the interview itself. But certainly, you need to consider that um, after the interview, and and how that um, flows into, you know, what your what your offer needs to look like. I would strategize um, as to how I would negotiate my salary. I would reference the salary surveys, but I would also reference those um, qualifications. And I would consider um, instances where you exceed the minimum qualifications, where you have those preferred qualifications, where it requires a master's degree, but you have two master's degrees. 
or you have a, it requires a master's degree and you have a PhD that's relevant, or you have more service, for example. I would encourage you uh, to um, be able to, to use those as specific things you cite if you attempt to counter um, the offer. As far as negotiation, one of the things I can tell you is I think most employers give earnest offers. Um, few of them hold back to see if the person counters. And the primary reason for that is, uh, particularly for public entities, but for most entities in general, the person's likely to find out what other people are making when they come to work there. You're interested in paying people fairly because you're hiring for a long term. And you do not want them to find out later that, you know, that they're paid, you know, disproportionate to other folks um, at the institution. Uh, I would think I, I am sometimes surprised by the apparent lack of thought that people have put into a couple of things in anticipation of receiving an offer. And one of those would be when could you report uh, to work? And so that, the factors in that obviously would be notice to your current employer, how long would it take for you to complete school. Um, and the completion of school, I think, is one that you would probably see come up in the interview. Um, and particularly in the interview or at some point it, it, in the cover letter. Um, if, you can, if you have one more semester of school and you're able to do that remotely somehow, I would clearly communicate that because um, you don't want that lack of knowledge to be a deciding factor that this person could show up potentially sooner. Um, and then other personal arrangements you might have. And we will, um, when we offer librarian positions and, and professional positions, and uh, we will typically give people extended periods to report. Um, our thought is for the right person, a couple of months or maybe even longer is not, um, is, is, is worth, it's a sound investment. So if someone has a child that's in school and they want them to complete that year, you know, depending upon how far we are into the year, or if they have an important assignment or they've committed to being part of the curriculum of a program, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll permit that. So I would, I would think about those. Um, and is there some other information that you need? Um, benefits, relocation assistance, if it hasn't been discussed, and then trailing partner assistance. I encourage you not to bring up trailing partner at the very end, um, I, I, you know, at the point at which you've received an offer. I would bring it up earlier. I think you'll find uh, most employers are very, uh, interested in, in, in understanding uh, that they need to um, be supportive. Uh, for references, um, I've got a, a section on references because I feel they're critically important. Um, select according to what the search committee is looking for. What does that mean? Well, if the position requires, uh, or if the, if the responsibilities of the position include supervision, and you have supervised in the past, but it was some time ago or it was in a different industry, that may not, a reference that can speak to that experience may not be your standard reference, but for this position, you might want to include it as a reference. Um, so uh, I, I would also consider references a resource that you need to cultivate and to engage people that would serve as good references through your current employment or, or through your school um, or through professional service and affiliation and, and folks that you meet networking on uh, through professional associations. When you are going to use somebody as a reference, I would let them know um, that you, you've had a phone interview and they're likely to be contacted um, or at some point prior to them being contacted so they understand who's calling them and, and what. I would provide them with a current uh, copy of your resume that they can use for the reference. I would share the cover letter that you provided and the job posting. And I would tell them why you picked them, which means what part of your experience you think it's important, most important for them to address. And I think references, um, generally they're going to be used because they're successful people, they're people in positions of standing. I think that they will appreciate the, the advice because they want to be successful and they wish you well and they want to help you so they would welcome the coaching. Current employers as references, it is fine uh, to request that your current employer, if you, if you provide it, that they not be contacted unless you're a serious candidate or with some advance notice to you. Uh, I 
if it specifically says that they need a current employer, I would provide it. Um, generally, I would encourage you to provide current employers and just you know communicate to people um, in the email that includes your cover letter and your references and your resume uh, that you would appreciate this courtesy. But I will tell you, most employers are going to understand and support um, that you're seeking advancement. I would encourage you to credential yourself now. This is the kind of what do I do, what can I do if I have some time. Um, and I would seek training and, um, uh, that, and, and leadership and professional services opportunities specifically. And I would use those to build your competencies for where you want to be. Um, prepare for that next job, keeping yourself fresh and relevant, uh, demonstrating your interest in the field, your engagement in the field, aptitude and ability if you if through some sort of uh, service or leadership on a, on, a, on a project, you can demonstrate um, your aptitude and ability. And these also serve as opportunities for you to network. And um, you know our sponsor, LAMA, I think is a, is a terrific um, opportunity uh, for folks through the mentoring program and through other programs uh, to engage in that. Some examples, and I've already given you some of these, would, of ways to credential self would be to lead a student group. I would take papers or blogs and convert them into scholarship, um, attend professional meetings or discussion groups, networking, but also learning, um, and uh, I would attend conferences if, if feasible for you. And I would, I would encourage you to join professional associations like ALA and divisions of ALA like LAMA. Incorporate these experiences and accomplishments into your application materials, particularly your cover letter. Mention them, obviously, in your resume, but indicate how they're useful in your uh, cover letter and in your interviews and uh, use these to distinguish yourselves from other folks. Um, Fred's already shown you some information on, on LAMA and provided a, a link. I um, am also going to do that. The, um, and where I'm going to take you is to the Join LAMA page. Uh, this uh, webinar is, is, is uh, largely uh, geared towards uh, folks that have recently or, or will soon uh, complete an MLS program, though I'm, I'm glad for anyone else to have attended. Um, included uh, on this page, and there's a link in the slides to get you to here, is how to apply for membership. And ALA student members, the cost to join um, uh, LAMA is, is only $15. And, um, I can speak to you personally about my experience. I've been in libraries since 2005, and my experiences in LAMA, and, and there may be another division that it could, could provide this to, to folks also, but my experience and my affiliation uh, through LAMA has not only been personally uh, and professionally rewarding um, and um, expanded my understanding of, of the field, um, but it also has uh, the, the opportunity to network and meet other people who are interested or engaged in the same things as I am has been invaluable. So I really encourage you um, to credential yourself through joining a division of ALA. I would encourage you to consider joining LAMA. Again, um, there's all sorts of things uh, geared towards folks who are new in the profession, such as mentoring, and there's a real interest in uh, connecting um, interested new members with uh, service opportunities on, um, on different committees. Um, an additional helpful link uh, that I want to provide is uh, a, an article that I saw in the Chronicle of Higher Education online that is uh, geared towards uh, folks who are first time on the market. My last piece of advice, and this comes from uh, uh, someone uh, uh, that attended uh, one of my presentations, was get sleep, eat lunch, drink coffee, um, and uh, enjoy your day. And uh, so with that, I will conclude uh, my presentation. I really think that uh, if you follow the advice or if you use the information about how uh, hiring authorities process applications and consider applicants, uh, that it will improve your odds. I think improving your odds in this market uh, is, is critically important. And I wish all of you the best of luck. and. Uh, and thank you very much for your attention. Brian, thank you so much. Uh, we really appreciate your presentation, filled with a lot of very 
useful and practical information. Um, I'd also like to thank all of our participants, our audience, and I'd like to remind you that you um, will, we did record this, and you'll be getting a link to a recording in an email uh, shortly or by tomorrow morning. And also there'll be a short uh, evaluation survey in SurveyMonkey that goes along with that. And of course, we'd really appreciate your completing that. Uh, please check the LAMA website for future continuing education programs and webinars. And thank you very much for attending today. Bye-bye.